This video was brought to you by PureVPN. A hydrogen bomb goes off in Washington DC, effectively ending World War II, allowing the Axis powers to take over most of Europe, Asia and America. Or at least that's what happens in the fantastic alternative history piece, The Man in the High Castle. With the final season of the Amazon series upon us, I know some of you will share a feeling of wanting just a little bit more. When a series finishes up a season and I've got to wait a whole year to continue that story, or it's just finishing up in general, I often feel like wanting a supplementary piece. Obviously there is the brilliant yet heavily outdated book of the same name, by Philip K. Dick, but I tried that. I need something just a little bit more, something I can interact with. There was never a video game adaptation of the book or series, other than in a couple of mods for Hearts of Iron which only really provide a basic level experience of the world. Then I decided to start a game that has been sitting in my library for some time untouched. The perfect alternative to the Man in the High Castle in video game form. No, not the Wolfenstein games. Homefront. Although the Wolfenstein games are an obvious comparison to High Castle in the fact that they're both alternative history that involve the Nazis taking over most of the world, but the gameplay doesn't really match up with the themes of High Castle's story. If you're able to use your imagination just a little bit, the Homefront games, more specifically Homefront the Revolution, provide a brilliant alternative history and dystopian gaming experience, so much so that whilst playing through the main story and exploring the world, I found myself seeing a fair amount of parallels between it and the man in the High Castle. Now obviously, the biggest comparison between the two would be how they deal with the occupation of America by a foreign power. Instead of the Nazis and the Japanese Empire of High Castle, we have the DPR, or Democratic Republic of Korea, led by the Korean People's Army in Homefront, who have conquered most of American territories. The DPR and Nazis are both large, highly technologically advanced and abusive dictatorships and we witness the KPA raiding people's houses on the basis of the owner potentially having mildly interacted with someone related to the resistance. The paranoia on both sides, the public and the authorities' trust in civilians, is extremely high and showcased incredibly well in both media. Whilst the Koreans aren't as racially driven as the Nazis, that doesn't stop them from forcing segregation of citizens, often coercing gender and class differences to separate, and anyone who's known to cause trouble or disobey their new leadership is brought to the prison zones, basically walled off sections of the city for the worst of the worst, or rather, anyone who isn't dangerous enough to kill but still not willing to align with the KPA. This class divide isn't showcased quite as much in the Greater Reich of High Castle, However, there is an obvious prevalence of racial discrimination across America in that universe, and prisoners are often treated horribly, sometimes tortured or used as test subjects for experiments. We're presented with a number of reasons to despise the occupiers in both media, initially from the fact that they've conquered a large chunk of western civilization. however, out with real world and historical reasoning, the narrative gives us good reason to root for the resistance more and more as the story goes along. From the Nazis forcing one of High Castle's protagonists to shoot someone, to the Japanese torturing Frank and gassing his family, to the brainwashing of Benjamin Walker, the centerpiece of Homefront's revolution. Even non-developed characters are described as being brutally tortured and taken advantage of by the KPA, like Ned Sharp's men who are locked up in a police station. Something we don't see too much of in The Man in the High Castle is worker camps, or the remnants of mass executions. We do see people lined up in the streets to die by firing squad which features in Homefront 2, however we don't see the entirety of the atrocities within High Castle. They're only hinted at, like when Kido informs Frank that he'll be dying near an old internment camp. They're simply assuming our previous knowledge of World War II era depravity. Homefront leans into this angle a little more, with a wider range of emotions, having some goofy camaraderie between the resistance members to some seriously sombre moments, such as the baseball field turned into a mass grave with diggers pouring bodies into it. Even with the alternative timelines in High Castle that were revealed after we saw prisoners being forced into an interdimensional portal experiment line up with Homefront, although in a different manner. Homefront and Homefront the Revolution both take place in separate universes that endure similar fates, with alternate methods of getting to that place of anarchy that we witness within the games. With a power hungry leader and oil supplies dwindling in the first game, to the revolution having North Korea taking a different route and becoming a technological superpower, consuming America via backdoor into their military. Does this mean that there is some sort of time or dimensional travel in the Homefront universe? Probably not, but it's another parallel that I feel fleshes out the universe. Having these two big what ifs, exploring how certain actions can ripple into future devastation. This is explored a little more in the DLC chapters, allowing you to take the point of view of other resistance members before and after the events of the main story, but I won't spoil any of that. Now, the Homefront games aren't exactly revolutionary in terms of gameplay. 
The first one provides us with a fairly linear Call of Duty structure, and the revolution gives us a typical open world game, where we need to hunt down and clear areas of the map to progress. But the world. That's where these games shine through. We get a unique take on an alternate reality that truly fascinates me, in the same way that High Castle fascinated me. These little details in the resistance bunkers and hideaways to the sterile look in both the Nazis and KPA stations. The revolution takes you on a journey through a war-torn Philadelphia. You witness the slums, the devastation of the initial attacks and gassing, but you also see how the Koreans treat the people of the world. And they're not seen as people, simply machines, tools to expand the DPR's empire bit by bit. Although you do get to see the higher class areas, where the streets are far cleaner, the buildings are much more spacious, and everyone's a little less on edge. With some Americans working for the Koreans as dignitaries, much like how in High Castle we have Americans, even World War II veterans working as high ranking officers, like Oprah Gruppenführer Smith, who would later rise up the chain of command. Immersion is key in a game like this where the world is its strongest asset, and my biggest complaint would be how the enemy impact that world. There isn't a dynamic situation put in place where the KPA would attack strongholds or areas that you've already taken from them, like they'd naturally want to do, to try and control the resistance threat. I understand it could get a little frustrating, but it could be utilised to build upon the world even further, showcase the diminishing relationship between the KPA and the American public more, as you and the resistance fighters move towards your goal of recapturing the city. There is, however, random events that sprout up on the map, showcasing ambushes, KP operations and convoys in the surrounding area, which is a good middle ground, but their presence in the area isn't as impactful as I would have liked. The revolution does however beat out a more recent game that had much more resources in this. Going back to the comparison of Wolfenstein, their version of an open world experience, Youngblood, is far from immersive. Having overtly quirky, unfunny and most importantly unrealistic dialogue crammed into every moment. But it's the open world aspect that really lets it down. It doesn't really benefit from being open at all. You feel like you don't really have any impact on the occupation at all, with constantly respawning enemies, some of which are just bullet sponges rather than the developers trying to provide us with a more cerebral challenge or at least something interesting that adds to the lore. Whereas Homefront, much like the man in the high castle, follows the resistance slowly getting more and more power, taking over different areas, rallying communities, and even when they fall down, with their back against the wall, with almost all of their armaments gone, they get right back up and push on, inspiring the locals to fight the good fight, to fight for their freedom. We see all of this in the development of the world. Initially people aren't too keen on you, dubbing you troublemakers, but as you rally more to your cause, the public start to celebrate your presence. The two Homefront games are far from perfect, but they're the closest thing to a Man in the High Castle game we're ever going to get. Sometimes watching shows like The Man in the High Castle can be restrictive depending on where you are in the world, and that's where VPNs come in handy. PureVPN has been great to use for checking in on things like Netflix US without any interruptions that other VPNs have sadly had. It's a fast reliable service that can keep your media experience immersive from watching movies and playing games all around the world, and you can get a special Black Friday offer of 88% off through my link. That equates to $1.32 a month. Make sure you take advantage of the deal while you can by going through the link in the description or the pinned comment below and join PureVPN today.